Hi, I'm Gina Farrar, Reinvention Coach, creator and host of Feminine Roadmap Podcast and leader of this amazing global community of women. If you are approaching midlife or are already in the thick of it, welcome home. Please grab a cup of something wonderful and join me for some real talk, practical strategies, and a big dose of sisterhood. I am so glad you're here. Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. Welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and changes of midlife and to live a more vibrant second half. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can not only survive, but thrive using practical tools to stop victimizing ourselves. Find what makes us happy, deal with rejection, set limits in relationships. And to have this conversation with me today, my guest is Laura Berg. She's a professor, a trained therapist, and the author of Thriving Life, How to Live Your Best Life No Matter What Cards You're Dealt. Laura, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because a lot of us feel in midlife, We feel a little bit stuck, lost, not sure what to do next. And so this conversation about a thriving life is almost like a reboot, really, at this season in life. So I'd love to know, what is it that led you to this specific message? I love that term reboot, actually. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with you in that. And I think that it's never too late to have a reboot. Uh, What led me to this was a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to, I'm adopted and I have trauma surrounding being adopted. I've had rejection happen with my birth family and it's this whole long story. But one year I decided I'm going to post a video on YouTube sharing my story because I can't be the only person out there to experience this rejection. So I posted my video to YouTube And I was blown away by the response I got from people, people saying, I felt so alone until I heard your story. I I felt like something was wrong with me and it made me feel like instantly better. And I thought we all have stories to share. We've all had blips in the road, traumas, bad things happen. And by sharing your story, I realized the value that it has in helping other people. And so that was one sort of major catalyst I had that I wanted to share different stories that I've experienced throughout my life and the lessons I've learned from them. But I also wanted to uh, look at the things that I've gone through that are really common in life that other people experience, you know, that, that feeling of being stuck the feeling of not really feeling fulfilled, you know, uh, having issues with relationships or the feeling of rejection. All of these things are common threads that we tend to have, I think. Absolutely. It's the common human experience, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Because when I first wrote my book, I was looking at it going, I wrote it sort of chapter at a time and each chapter is a chunk of advice. It's not like a, a one solid book of one theme. And I thought, oh my gosh, this looks like a quilt. Like it's such a patchwork of things. But then I realized that all of these things are issues that a lot of people do have. So hopefully people will be able to read my book and it'll resonate with, uh, with a lot of them. Yeah. So let's go ahead and jump in. What, what are one of the topics that you find people resonate with the most? Do you have a topic in your book that really kind of comes up more often? Right. So in the book, a lot of the things we talk about are setting goals for yourself, about defining your happiness. This is a really big one for me uh, because I'm not telling people you should be happy because a lot of us deal with depression and you can't just wish yourself happy. That's not what I talk about in that particular chapter in the book. I talk about the importance of really defining what makes you happy because we grow up with this idea of what we should be doing in order to gain happiness. You know, our parents tell us you should be doing this and then you'll be happy. Society tells you you should be doing this and then you'll be happy. And a lot of those things aren't what makes you happy. So for me, for example, I love travel. 
I will forego buying new clothes, eating at fancy restaurants. I will save all my money so I could travel. That's what makes me happy. I have a friend who loves shopping and that's what makes her happy. So you have to figure out the things that make you happy and how you can write your life in order to live the most joy possible. So another thing that I wanted to do in life was I wanted to stay at home with my children after I had my daughter. I had infertility treatments with her. As an adopted person, I really wanted a genetic connection. So when I finally did get pregnant, uh, I just couldn't bear the thought of going back to work and leaving her. I really wanted to stay at home. Uh, but I had to figure out how to make that happen because we live in a big city. It's expensive. We need two incomes. So I sat down and figured out, okay, this is what I want in my life right now, which I know it'll change. And, and your idea of happiness might change as you grow. And so really sitting down to define what you want, not what your parents want, not what not society wants or your friends or anything. Because I think sometimes we don't spend enough time on that, on acknowledging what truly brings you bliss. Mm. Yes. And I think a lot of times as women, we are these, the anchor. We're the home base for so many people that we are creating that sense of safety, happiness. You know, we are kind of a, a well, if you will, that people draw from. It's often neglected in our own lives to do that for ourselves. 100%. I think a lot of women experience um, giving, 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 giving and not ever putting themselves first. And we almost feel guilty when we do put ourselves first, but you know what? There's nothing wrong. You have to put yourself first sometimes in order to be a better mom, be a better wife, be a better friend. You know, I find I go back to the travel thing. You probably hear this theme throughout this whole conversation, but I go on vacation with a girlfriend at least once a year. My husband stays at home with the children and it's, it's a time for me to just do what I want. I have to don't I don't have to worry about th what this person wants to do today. What will make this person happy? What does this person want to eat? It's about me. How long I want to take at dinner? What time I want to wake up? Do I want to go to the beach? These are things that and then I come back and I'm a way better mom because I've taken care of myself. Mm, that's so true. I I like to use the analogy of a cup with a hole in it. You know, mm -hmm. that life as worthy and as lovely as it can be loving and serving and caring for others that puts a hole in your cup. If you don't take the time to refill the cup, at some point we do burn out. And that idea that you talked about, what's our version of happiness? It's like, what is that thing that brings us joy? And there's room for that. Don't you agree in our lives? There has to be, you have to make room for that because if you don't, then it'll affect your other relationships. If you don't have joy in your life, you know, you start resenting the people around you because, and you feel like they, they're taking, 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 but you have to set those boundaries with people. You have to put yourself first because it's okay to do that because you're a better person when you do. Mm. What are some of the ways that you encourage people to set boundaries? And in what situations do you find women really struggle to set boundaries? I think women struggle to set boundaries in every situation, honestly. Uh, we grow up feeling that we can't set boundaries. And if we do, we're viewed in a negative light. And we have to stop telling ourselves that. And we have to stop telling our daughters that. And, you know, we're expecting women to behave certain ways because we feel that by them putting themselves first or by them setting boundaries that they're somehow evil or selfish. In my book, I do talk about setting boundaries. I spend three chapters on it because it's very important. I talk about setting boundaries with friends. I talk about setting boundaries with romantic relationships. And I set boundaries with family members because I think, honestly, that's probably the hardest for people is setting boundaries for family members, because it doesn't matter how old you are, you're always going to feel like a little kid to your parents, you know, and it's really hard for you to almost have a shift in that relationship. And if your parents didn't treat you the way you wanted to be treated, how do you as an adult tell them 
that you are no longer going to accept that treatment from them. So it's very difficult. You know, even siblings, they have issues with that and how your dynamics change as you grow. And I, I think it's really important. So one analogy I use, and my mom actually um, shared this with me because I had a really tough relationship with my brother. He had a really troubled life and there was a lot of take, 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 uh, because he just lived in the victimhood position his whole life. And I always felt that whenever he was in my life and he was wanting from me, it caused me to be depressed and it caused me to have low self-esteem and self-worth. And my mom said, you have to look at it. But then I felt guilty. Sorry to backtrack. I felt guilty when I didn't help him and at the detriment to my own mental health. And so my mom said, look at your relationship like a building. He lives on the main floor. You live on the 20th floor. It's reasonable for you to say, let's meet halfway. Let's meet on the 10th floor. But people can't always do that because you're not always, he was never in an emotional position to be able to meet me halfway. But it's okay for me to say, why don't you meet me on the fifth floor? Because if I'm the one constantly walking up and down, I'm walking down to meet him, then back up to my own place, I'm walking down to meet him, back up to my own place. I am completely drained and exhausted and he's giving me nothing. So I said to him, you know, I'll, I'll meet you on the metaphorical fifth floor. Uh, so I'm giving more than I'm expecting him to give, but I'm not giving him everything. I need to set that boundary and that limit. And if you're willing to come up to this for help, I will help you. So I always have buildings in my mind and for my relationships. Mm, that's a fantastic analogy. And I do think in a perfect world, we'd always meet halfway, right? In oh, yeah. World, yeah, that'd be awesome. But I do think there are times when we give a little more or we take a little more. And I think yeah. that ebb and flow is good for us to be aware of. And And I was thinking as you were talking that there's a real need for a sense of self in this process. Yes, exactly. This goes back to defining what makes you happy and acknowledging what you need. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that relationship with my brother, I wasn't going to get happiness. Well, that's not the right term because I do get, I did get happiness from him, but it was important for me to realize what I was giving to him and what I needed from that encounter because I needed to not be sucked into that black hole constantly. I needed him to at least put some effort into allowing me to help him that acknowledged that I needed something from him as well. And that's okay. You're going to have people in your life that will never be able to help you, but you have to make sure that those people in your life don't hurt you by you helping them. Yeah. And that's that idea of that sense of self being like, I'm me. I'm not just your sister or I'm not yes. just your mother or I'm not just your daughter. It's that yes. sense of self like, you're Laura, I'm Gina. And what does that look like? Exactly. How is that defined? And and the courage that it takes to define that for ourselves. Like those those are pieces of us, daughter, sister, friend whatever, mother possibly. And if we know who we are in the midst of those roles, I think it would make it easier to, to find those definitions. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head. It takes work. It takes work. It takes acknowledgement. It takes sitting in that feeling to identify what you're not getting out of something and what you do need. And on top of that, you talk about all these different roles you have to understand that you are you first above anything else. I am a person before I'm mom. I'm Laura before I'm mom. I'm Laura before I'm a wife. So I have to take care of Laura in order for me to be that mom, to be that wife. And I think we forget that. I think we forget to take care of our own selves. Yeah. There's a big topic in the world about self-care and in my mind, self-care is all fine and wonderful. But it's easy to get very like, take a bath and do these wonderful things, light the candles. Those are all great. But I think without that 
knowing what true care for ourselves is. Like when I think of self-care, I think you get into a situation with someone, maybe you have a pattern like you did with your brother, where you have to become aware how that pattern is impacting you. And the Mm -hmm. self-care is to say, I'm not going to put myself in that situation. Yes, exactly. I'm going to protect myself more or I'm going to stand up for myself more or whatever. I think self-care goes to that level where it's literally caring for our sense of self so we don't get lost in that journey because some relationships do consume like you're talking about. Exactly. And I think it's also about identifying your feelings around a relationship or a situation. And because a lot of us, we will, let's go say, let, let's say I went and visited my brother and then I was miserable, you know, a week afterwards. And I didn't sit to identify why am I feeling this way? You know, I just let it happen. I'm trying to ignore it. You know, oh, I'm really down right now. I feel really blue. But I'm, I'm not sitting and thinking, okay, I'm feeling blue because I went to his place and he said this, which made me feel this way. And that is why I'm feeling blue. So this is where the work comes in because your feelings and emotions can take over and really consume you unless you acknowledge what is causing those negative feelings to happen. And it's, it's, I do a lot of, um, I talk a lot sort of about CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, because I love the concept of CBT where you have to really sit with why am I feeling this way? What is the true reason behind it? And acknowledge that and then work on that because that will improve your Mm. emotions around that area. Yeah. As you're talking about that awareness piece, right? Like, yes. What is it that makes me feel this way? Or identifying a pattern. When I spend time with this person, I feel this way consistently, yeah. right? Yes. It yeah. could be good feelings. It could be negative feelings. You know, it could be, like you said, just a blue depressive kind of state. And I think in that situation, part of the awareness is acknowledging that someone else's ideas expectations, their opinions don't have to define us. Maybe we've allowed it to, maybe that's been something that this is my role in this relationship, right? Or this situation. And there's some courage involved in the process because I think as we change and as our lives change and situations change, sometimes it's necessary to stop doing things we've always done sometimes for healthy reasons, sometimes it's just situational. And, and I think separating ourselves from the role, the ideas attached to that role, that real sense of self again, you know, when we're talking about, if you want to thrive in life, whose life are we living? Yes, exactly. And how do you help people live their best? Because that's that subtitle of your book, how to live your best life, no matter what cards you're dealt. What yeah. kind of tools and strategies do you share with people to accomplish that? So I have tips throughout, you know, each chapter that is sort of questions that I have people answer or things that I have them think about, you know, maybe I get them to write something on paper um, in response to, you know, setting boundaries with relationships and it, it really helps them to identify the things that they don't like about, say, that particular relationship. Or, you know, I have a chapter on um, if you do nothing, nothing happens. Mm. So in life, if you do nothing, nothing happens. So you, we, we have all of these great ideas. I want to do this. I want to do that. I wish this. I wish that. But it's taking that first step to make it happen for yourself. That is the hardest step. And I think a lot of people get stuck. You know, I've had friends who have planned to do this for a long time and planning, 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 but they never take action to make that plan reality. And so in the book, I talk about how to set goals, how to tackle those goals and, you know, get people to sit down and actually put pen to paper and answer the questions that I might pose to them. What are the common reasons that you come across as a therapist of why people don't take action? Why they just plan and plan and plan and plan? Well, there's 
really a couple things. Number one is the plan it seems too big. So mm -hmm. it's so intimidating that they can't figure out what step they need to take. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I recommend is you just, you have a big goal in mind and then what are the steps that you need to take in order to get to that goal? You write down those steps and then you get rid of all of the steps after the first one, you know, and you just focus on that one step. I remember when I started university, I thought, I can't do this for four years. I'm thinking I'm going to die. <laughs> um, I, all of these papers and tests and exams, and I just won't be able to do it. It's so overwhelming. And I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to just focus on this year, on this one class, on this first assignment. And it, and I'm going to not think about the next four years. So that's really overwhelming for people. And then another thing is just um, planning and over planning. So sometimes you can over plan for something because it's that over planning and rethinking that stops you from actually just diving in and getting something done and taking that first step. So those are two major problems that I think people face. I know for me, the thinking piece when I was growing up was how I dealt with the cards I was dealt was really kind of processing and thinking and analyzing and kind of putting things in their place. And that can become a habit that it, it served a really great purpose at certain seasons of my life. And it still does serve some purposes, but sometimes it feels like the thinking is the doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You talk about, you know, us dealing with the cards we were dealt in life and, you know, some of us have been dealt a really bad hand, like really terrible. Honestly, I've talked to very few people who haven't had something in their life that is like you think, oh, poor you. I can't believe that you had to deal with that. The thing is, is not letting those negative experiences control the rest of your life. Uh, that was a big revelation for me because I lived a lot of my life in the victim mentality. I was a victim and I was poor me, poor me. I, I struggle because this happened to me and I realized, so I'll give you one example. My father was very abusive and it affected relationships I had. And it was that abuse, that, that self worth that I did not have because I, of that constant berating me and, and, and emotionally and physically. And it was just, but when I became an adult, I cut him out of my life. But what he had done to me as a kid still affected me. I was still an abused person. I was still a victim. And he was no longer in my life. But I was still allowing him to victimize me. And so, yes, I got dealt an awful hand with him. But I was continuing to play that same hand throughout my whole life. You don't have to do that. I decided at that point, I am no longer going to be a victim. I am a survivor. I am better than what he made me feel I was. And I really made that shift. So really, no matter what cards you have been dealt with in life, and some of us have had really, really tough lives, you can still take control over how you're going to let those situations affect your current and future life. Mm. Yes. That's an interesting, like, um, it's almost like you kind of look at your life and then step out of it. Yes. Like physically Have remove to. yourself from it. It's such work. Like it is such hard work to change the way that you are currently living, whether it be, setting goals and going after that, whether it be you're a victim and you're living in that victim mentality, which is continuing to victimize yourself or, you know, relationships, you want to set boundaries, whatever it is, you, it's work. You have to sit, really acknowledge what you want and what you're doing and how 
you're going to make those changes. And then even as you're making those changes, you have to sit and recognize that those are the steps you're taking. You're doing a great job. You keep going or I've fallen back into the old mentality. How am I going to change it? It is work. The interesting thing about all of this is we can look to neuroplasticity and science and see that this work can be done. Yeah. We have to weaken those bonds, those thought patterns in our mind. And so what resources do you offer people to help them take that journey? Well, as I said, I do have, um, you know, tips throughout the book that help people on the first step that they need to take in order to start that thought process. And, you know, if you go through and, and answer the questions, honestly, that I do have in the book and do the exercises, then hopefully you'll be able to start taking them a bit further beyond even just the advice that I have in the book. Do you have any favorite questions that you use often? Oh, that's a good question. I don't have any particular favorite question. I just, uh, the biggest thing is, do you feel fulfilled in your life? Do you feel happy? Not, I keep going back to, I'm not saying be happy. I'm saying, what do you feel in your life? Like, are you satisfied? Do you feel like you could improve it? Do you feel like you want change in your life? Because if you do, then you have to make that change. It's acknowledging that, yes, I want change in my life. And I think midlife is, if, if one word was used to define midlife, I would say change. Yes. Is by far the top word for yeah, midlife. And, but it's also scary, you know, change in midlife is very scary, mm -hmm. but it's something that you can do at any stage in your life. I think that perspective on change is actually the first step, how we view change, how we view not doing things the way we've always done things. Yeah. You know? And it's, you know, a lot of us want change and, you know, we think it'll happen one day, but what makes you think it'll happen one day if you don't take steps to make it happen? Right. <laughs> it's one of those, it's kind of an existential question, right? Yeah. What makes you think it's just going to cosmically happen if you know about it today and you're like, yeah, I'm not going to deal with that every single day of your life, right? You end up with regret. Yeah. If you say, I want to feel better. I hope one day I'll feel better. You know, well, what makes you think that something's going to happen in life that you don't do that will make you feel mm. better? Mm. Like you have to do something. Nobody else can do it for you. It's that sense of personal responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. Which is hard. And, and just the, f the feeling of overwhelm. Change is hard. It, it can feel overwhelming. That's why you need to sort of take it in baby steps and break those small things down into smaller things that are manageable and, and actionable. Would you say, Laura, that sometimes people start on a path to change and then they realize, hey, that's not the change that I wanted? Oh, definitely. I think people do that all the time. You think you want one thing and then, you know, you may even get to the point where you get that thing and then you're like, you know what? I don't, I don't really want that. And that's okay. That's great. It's recognizing that that's not the thing that you thought you wanted. And then set another goal. Keep moving. You know, we're always moving. You're breathing, you're eating, you're walking, you're working. You know, you're changing. Let's change some more. It's really interesting how we romanticize things sometimes. We really think it's going to be this one thing. Yes, exactly. And then you get there and you're like, oh, well. <laughs> that's not quite what I expected it to be. Right. No, it's true. And, but then also, you know, acknowledging that and, and being okay with that, like you, you made things happen for yourself and you didn't like the thing that happened. So let's keep going. Let's move on. Mm. And what did you learn in that process? See, that's, mm -hmm. I think where the gold is, right? It's the learning. Everything is a learning experience. I, in fact, one of the chapters in my book is talking about how a lot of times in life, bad things happen to us and we wallow in that. But I propose the idea of what if bad things weren't bad? 
What if they were just things that happened to you? And that can really help you deal with that perceived bad thing because you can then look at the lesson that you learned from having that experience. You know, uh, it was bad that my father was abusive. Yes, 100%. That was a bad thing that happened to me. But if I take bad out of it, I look at how I definitely don't want people to treat me and how I really need to value who I am because I was not shown value by him. So the lesson that I can learn from that really terrible experience is what? And then you take that and take control over that bad thing that happened and you turn it into something good. So I am married to a very wonderful, loving, supportive, the best man. He is amazing. And it's because I refuse to be in a relationship with somebody who was remotely like my father. But if I chose not to learn from that relationship or that bad thing that happened to me, I would continue to let that bad thing happen to me in other relationships. And that's actually a key that you're sharing. It's that pattern in our life and acknowledging our part in that pattern. That's right. You know, we may not have put ourselves in that situation as a child, obviously, you yes. know, being in an abusive environment is often not, <laughs> that's not our choice as a child. It's, it's not at all. the consequences of another person's decision have now permanently impacted our lives. Yes. But there's an intersection at some point, right? And that's what I'm hearing you say. You hit an intersection. This is really hard to say to people because people get angry with me when I say that you have to acknowledge your role in the things that are happening in your life. And no, I did not have a role in my father beating me when I was a child. I was, a, I was an innocent child, but eventually I have to acknowledge how that is affecting me now. And do I want to let that continue to affect me? And people get angry because they don't want to see beyond that victimhood. You know, people don't like to be told that they're acting like a victim or they're living in a victimhood. But I can say with all honesty, I lived a big chunk of my life that way. And it did not make me happy. It did not help me become where I am today. It held me back. And so, but when you're in it, when you are in that victimhood moment, it's really hard to say, yeah, you know, I'm acting like a victim. I really need to change things. It's not easy. And this is the whole thing I really want people to understand. It's work. Being a victim is so hard. And it's a valid place to be. You were victimized. It's an, a fully valid feeling for you to be in. But let's recognize how that's affecting your life now. It's like we re-victimize ourselves. Yep. Yep. That's a big part. And, it, and, and I know it's hard. But, you know, whether you're the victim or you're the savior, you're always saving and fixing everybody. That could be another role that somebody plays. Yeah. You know, what questions can we ask ourselves? Like for me, one of the big questions is, does this still serve me? How did it serve me at some point? Because I think that's helpful to understand too, don't you? Like at some point, oh, 100%. this made sense in my life. Whether it was healthy or not isn't the question. It's at some point, this made sense. At some point, in some way this served me. And I feel like yes. that victimhood or that over-serving, that question, does this still actually serve me? Like, is this still a good way to live my life? Regardless of what it did in the past, right now, yes. is this working? Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. And that's challenging because back to that sense of self, it, it, I feel like this journey, Laura, is meeting yourself. Oh, it's definitely. Like, it's, it's really between you and you. you know? It really is. And, and understanding that that's okay. That's okay that you are taking the time to rediscover yourself and your needs. Um, 
you said something interesting though, whether you're a victim or a savior and being in the savior role is, can be hard too. It can be emotionally draining and, you know, so acknowledging that that's the role that you're often playing for others, uh, that can be harmful to yourself. It feels good. Being the savior feels good. Um, but acknowledging that that's the role that you are playing and how it affects you is important as well. It's interesting. We get a lot of worth and value out of the roles that we play, don't we? We really do. Yeah. Yeah. Even the unhealthy ones. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes we don't acknowledge the unhealthy ones. We don't recognize them as unhealthy unless we stop and sit and think about, you know, how it makes us feel. It sounds like your book, though, is an agent of change for people. That's my hope. I hope that, you know, if people are sort of thumbing through it, not every chapter will resonate with every person because, you know, maybe they have a great family relationship and they don't need to set boundaries with family members. But still, you know, the advice in the book, my hope is that people will read it and see themselves in it. And and I share in every chapter what I experienced because I was a victim. I, you know, needed to take action. I had to set boundaries and I share my stories so that people who are reading my book know that I'm coming from it, from a place of experience, personal experience, not just professional experience. I went through to get a psychotherapy degree because I wanted to write this book. I never wanted to be a therapist because I'm so emotionally sensitive and I would take everybody's problems on and it would just, I don't know, it would be very difficult for me. But the reason why I went and got a psychotherapy degree was because I wanted to write this book for people and give them sort of expertise knowledge from an educated standpoint. But I also wanted to come at it from, I get you. I was that person. I went through this. I am coming at it from a person who has lived it and who has made changes and is still making changes. You know, another thing I talked about in my book is imposter syndrome. Mm. We all at one point have imposter syndrome where we feel we're not worthy. We're not smart enough. We're not good enough. I still experience that. So, you know, I'm, I'm a work in progress as well. Mm. That's a really good point. You know, that the work is never done technically pieces of it piece, the big kind of the real shifts, those I would say, once you've made a big shift, as long as you stay on that path, unless you just slip, you don't really have to redo the big pieces. It's those Mm -hmm. little decisions, those tweaks in uh, old thoughts that creep up, whether it's imposter syndrome, sense of worth, you know, worrying about what other people think, which I think is a huge part of why we don't take the steps. Yes, 100%. And I still suffer from that. And I, you know, even after writing my book, I still go through, oh, no, what are people going to think? What are, you know, it was such a raw thing to be so open about my own personal experiences and then, you know, have somebody write a negative review. And, and I think, but all I'm trying to do is help. Uh, why are you being mean to me? <laughs> you know, so even though I seem like, oh, she's so together, she's this, she's that. I still suffer from it and I still, you know, have moments of woe is me and I stop myself and think, why am I feeling this way? It's the skills that you learn that you develop of recognizing and sitting with your emotions and thoughts that uh, is the big thing that will bring change. And then you can apply that when you find those things creeping back into your life. You know, what's interesting is you were talking about other people. I think this is one of those journeys that we have to have the courage to take alone and know that sometimes taking a journey that's good for us will actually impact our relationships with other people. There are people that get triggered by or are threatened by us changing roles in their lives. 100%. That is definitely a thing that I talk about in my book, especially with friendships. You know, we finally want to change things in your life and people don't like it because they're comfortable in the role that they have with you. And yeah, you know, and, and understand that you will lose relationships and you need to be okay with that because they're not healthy relationships if they're so easily lost. Mm, Good point. 
as we wrap up today, what three anchor points can you offer my audience as they think about living their best life, no matter where they find themselves right now? What three anchor points would you like to share? I think number one is defining what makes you happy in life and where you're at right now. Uh, I think number two would be to take action. You know, make those changes happen for yourself because they're not just going to happen one day just because. Uh, that's really, really important. And I think the other thing is it's okay to put yourself first. You have to put yourself first. So that means doing for you, setting boundaries in relationships, deciding what is best for you, uh, and taking care of your needs before anybody else's needs, because you can't, you can't take care of other people unless you take care of yourself. Good point. Well, Laura, I want to thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. And I appreciate your gentle kind of sensitive way of talking about it. I love that it's, it's encouraging, it's kind, it's supportive, it's not hard hitting and judgmental. I think that sensitivity and that care really needs to be part of the change process because the harder we are on ourselves, the harder it is to change. So that grace you brought to the conversation is something I think that's very precious and necessary for people to do the things that you are encouraging them to do in your book. So thank you for bringing that to my tribe today. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And how can people find you, Laura? Uh, they can visit Laura Berg, Inc. It's I-N-C dot com. Awesome. And your book, is it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all of the major? Yeah, it's in all the major places. Awesome. All right, friends, today I've been speaking with Laura Berg, professor, trained therapist, and author of Thriving Life, How to Live Your Best Life No Matter What Cards You're Dealt. And if you head on over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 248, I will have links to Laura and her book there. You can also join my tribe. I send out periodic encouraging emails. Friends, this is one of those conversations that just keeps looping around, isn't it? We come face to face with ourselves, the situations in our lives, our relationships, where we find ourselves, and we sometimes feel stuck, lost, discouraged. And it's okay. I think accepting that reality and then beginning to ask ourselves questions. Well, what do I really want? What would make me happy? What is draining me? And getting Laura's book and doing the work of reading it and answering the questions could be a way to begin that journey because sometimes we don't have the tools of change in us, but we can learn those tools of change. We can change. It's actually a scientific fact. You can get Laura's book. You can surround yourself with supportive, loving people. This is the work that's worthy work. And we encourage you to take it on if you're feeling that niggle in your spirit that things just need to change. They can. Buckle up, take the chance, and make the change. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to sharing more with you in the weeks to come. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye. <laughs>